were the monsters within us, the monsters of psychology, of personality, alcoholic psychosis, and madness. And this particular story is one which I think is the best example of what is and that is the telltale part. True. True. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, that's okay. very, very Dreadfully nervous I have been and am. Why would you say that I'm mad? The disease had sharpened my senses. Not destroyed, not golden. Above all, there's the sense of hearing acute. I heard all things in heaven and in the earth. I've heard many things in hell. Oh, then, am I mad? Harker. And observe just how calmly, how healthfully I can tell you the whole story. It is impossible to say how first the idea entered my brain. But once conceived, it haunted me day and night. Object, there was none. Passion, there was none. I loved the old man. He never wronged me, he had never given me insult. For his gold, I had no desire. And what was it then that caused in me this feeling of revulsion whenever I looked at him? I think. It was his eye, yes. It was this one of his eyes resembled that of a vulture, a pale blue eye with a film over it. Whenever it fell upon me, my blood ran cold. And so by degrees, very gradually, I made up my mind to take the life of the old man and thus rid myself of the eye forever. Now, listen to the point. You fancy me mad. A madman does nothing. <laughs> Ah, but you should have seen me. You should have seen how wisely I proceeded with what caution, with what foresight, with what dissimulation I went to work. I was never kinder to the old man than during the whole week before I killed him. And every night, about midnight, I turned the latch of his door and opened it so gently, gently. And when I had made an opening sufficient for my head, I put in a dark lantern, all closed, closed, so that the light shone out. And then I thrust in my head. <laughs> you would have laughed to see how cunningly I thrust it in. I moved it slowly, very, very slowly, so that I might not disturb the old man's sleep. It took me an hour to place my whole head within the opening so far that I could see him as he lay upon his bed. Would a madman have been as wise as this? Then when my head was well in the room, I undid the lantern cautiously so Cautiously, cautiously, the hinges creaked. I undid it just so much that a single dim ray fell 
upon the vulture eye. And this I did for seven long nights every night, just at midnight, but I found the eye always closed. And so it was impossible to do the work, for it was not the old man who vexed me, but his evil eye. And every morning, I went boldly into his chamber and spoke courageously to him, calling him by name in a hearty tone, and inquiring how he passed the night. So you see, he would have been a very profound old man indeed to suspect that every night, just at midnight, I looked in upon him while he slept. Upon the eighth night. I was more than usually cautious in opening the door. The watch's minute hand moves more quickly than did mine. Never before that night had I felt the extent of my own powers, of my sagacity. I could scarcely contain my feelings of triumph to think that there I was, opening the door, little by little, and he did not even dream of my secret deeds or thoughts. <laughs> I, I chuckled at the idea, and perhaps he heard me, for he moved on the bed suddenly as if startled. Now, you may think that I drew back, but no, no. The room was black as pitch with a pure darkness, for the shutters had been locked in fear of robbers. So I knew he could not see the opening of the door. I kept pushing it off steadily, steadily. <coughs> had my head in and was about to open the lantern when my thumb slipped upon the tent fastening. The old man sprang up at the bed crying out, Who's there? I kept quite still and said nothing. For a whole hour I did not move a muscle and in the meantime I did not hear him lie down. He was still sitting up in the bed, listening just as I had done, night after night, hearkening to the death watches in the wall. And then I heard a slight groan, and I knew it was the groan of mortal terror. It was not a groan of pain, of grief, oh no. It was the low, stifled sound that arises from the bottom of the soul when overcharged with awe. I knew that sound well. Many a night, just at midnight, when all the world slept, it has welled up from my old bosom, of keeping with its dreadful echo. The terrors that distracted me, I say, I knew the sound well. Yes, I knew what the old man felt and pitied him, although <laughs> I chuckled at heart. I knew that he'd been lying awake ever since the first slight noise when he'd moved upon the bed. His fears had been ever since growing upon him, 